Hi everybody, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Am I bad luck? Am I the curse that is keeping this rocket on the ground? I haven't been live streaming much at all in the last like six months. This is the launch and I'm like, you know, I'm going to stream this one. And here we are with the fourth attempt in a row now. Uh, fourth attempt in five days. They did not attempt on Saturday. None of them so far have been SpaceX's fault. There's been two weather attempts and then uh, yesterday the launch attempt was scrubbed because there was a cruise liner that was in the exclusion zone so within the corridor of like do not boat here do not fly here uh you're in the path of a rocket uh that was violated by a cruise ship so unfortunately we are here again today uh for, for four times now so uh yeah hi guys uh of course if you guys have any questions about what rocket is going to be launching or anytime there's rockets coming up and you want to know where they're launching from what they're doing why they're doing blah 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 we have you covered just go over to everydayastronaut.com click on upcoming launches and you will get our list uh, pre-launch previews. Now this one is CSG2, Falcon 9 Block 5. I should be really good at this by now. This is my fourth time doing the same thing. Uh, I'm just gonna, we're just going for it. There might be new people watching this one, so we want to give them a chance to to learn. And then of course I'll be answering guys' questions as often and as frequently as I can. All right, so this is hopefully going to be taking off to, oh, I don't think I refreshed. I got naughty, naughty me. There we go. Uh, <laughs> January 30th, 31st, 2022 that is today in uh tweet t minus uh 26 minutes and 43 seconds so 2311 utc or 611 eastern uh the mission name is the cosmo uh cosmo sky sky med second generation um also known as c G c s g2 the launch provider who is launching this payload into space is spacex the customer who's paying for this ride the people that are like hey I have this thing, I want to get it into space. That is the Italian Space Agency, or the uh, Agenzia uh, Speciale, Speciale Italiana. Uh, the rocket is the Falcon 9 Block 5, the only version of Falcon 9 that's flying these days, um, and has been the only one flying for a couple years now. Uh, this is Booster 1052-3, which is special, because this is actually, originally was not even a Falcon 9 booster. So when I said it was the only Falcon 9 flying, it's kind of a weird twist on things, because it was originally the side core booster of Falcon Heavy, um, of the second Falcon Heavy that flew it. It flew with those same side boosters on for two, for Arab 6A and also, um, what was that, uh, NROL? Or no, it was, uh, it was that uh, Air Force mission. I can't remember what it was called. But yeah, it was, it was originally uh, the side booster for two Falcon Heavy missions. They actually converted it to be a Falcon 9 booster, which is super cool. So um, STP2, thank you very much, James and Discord. Um, there we go. So yeah, that, this is a kind of a special, unique Falcon 9 because it originally was not a Falcon 9. I think that's fun. Launch location. This is taking off from Slick 40, Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. Um, this is, uh, so of course, that's going to be on the Cape Canaveral side, just across the river, up only about two miles away or 3.2 kilometers away or whatever. There, That would be what would be considered Kennedy Space Center. So that's all kind of out there on Cape Canaveral, but Cape Canaveral Space Force Station always has the SLC, so Space Launch Complex, and those that are on NASA's Kennedy Space Center will have just LC, Launch, Launch Complex. So that's how you can delineate the two. The payload mass for this, this thing's 2,230 kilograms, uh, about 5,000 pounds. It's uh, very, very lightweight for a Falcon 9. The Falcon 9 can take seven times more than that into low, low Earth orbit. So this is a pretty lightweight, although it uh, 
it because it's lightweight though it is going to a weird destination especially from the east coast it's flying it'll end up going a little bit west from the east coast so that means it has to do this weird dog leg maneuver which means it's going to actually fly straight south basically or nearly straight south um, and then at stage separation, the booster will come back and land, but the second stage will kind of dog leg and go around all the Caribbean islands or cut through a, a few of them and miss. So it's not overflying any Caribbean islands, pretty, uh, incredible mission planning and pretty, uh, high precision and high performance necessary to do that. Cause they actually end up slightly retrograde in order to get into sun synchronous orbit. You do have to be going slightly retrograde. So um, that does mean, so again, zero degree inclination would be if it's around the equator, 90 degree inclination would be over the North and or South poles. Well, North and South poles. You can't go over one without going over the other. Um, and then anything beyond 90 degrees would actually be getting slightly into retrograde. So that's just the way that sun synchronous orbits are. They're slightly retrograde. Uh, will they be attempting to recover the first stage? Yes, they are. Uh, where will this first stage be landing? This will be landing back on land LZ1. Super exciting. That makes this mission extra fun, which is one of the reasons I'm streaming. Uh, will they be attempting to recover the fairings? Yes, they will. Um, are these fairings new? No, they are not. Both fairings have flown on three previous missions. So yes, these fairings are slightly older than the booster, or more flown than the booster. I don't know about older, but have flown more. Uh, the weather is currently 90% go, uh, and hopefully there's no ships in the range. <clears throat> Uh, this is the 138th Falcon 9 launch ever. Incredible. Second return to launch site mission in 2022. 82nd reflight of a booster. 30th consecutive landing, assuming it lands, which is an ongoing record. Fourth reflight of a booster this year. Fourth launch for SpaceX this year. And eighth orbital launch attempt overall uh, internationally. So if you want to know more about this particular mission and about what CSG-2 is in the actual satellite, the Cosmos Sk SkyMed second generation CSG-2 satellite, um... Yeah, if you want to know more about this, you can read our awesome article. This is written by Austin DeSisto. Uh, thank you guys so much. And everyone in chat, thank Austin for this article. And thank the rest of our web crew for keeping this all up to date so that we can be in the know at the quick glance just by having upcoming launches bookmarked. We can quickly know anything about upcoming rocket launches. So, all right, let's get to a couple questions here before we get started. Um, oh, and yes. Uh, I should mention again, I'm, I just put the shirt right back on uh, before this launch. Don't worry, I didn't sleep in it. It's still clean, mom. Uh, <laughs> now, this is a, 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 we're just keeping the same launch day code for today for the RD-171 shirts. Uh, so if you want to take 10% off of the RD-171 shirt, which of course features some awesome sleeve prints, uh, custom sewn on patches, you know, custom labeling, custom packaging, all of it's legit, all done right here in the U.S. and shipped to you anywhere around the world. Head on over to everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Click on one of these RD-171 shirts and you can take 10% off today. Or is it 15% off? I don't know. Take some amount off at checkout by using the coupon code LAUNCHDAY. All lowercase, all one word, launch day for a nice little launch day discount. And enjoy yourself some nerdy, nerdy rocket swag. So... There you go. All right, let's get into these questions. Hopefully, I wonder if we'll have some new ones compared to what we've been answering. Because, like I said, I'm pretty much in Groundhog's Day here, just repeating the same stuff over and over. Um, and just so you know, I do have Mission Control audio pulled up. So if there is something that goes on over the, the nets, we should hear it as well. So, um, <laughs> so speaking of scrubs, hopefully this is not true. This is from St Stephen Crawford. I claim drone stops launch in the what's next. I If this thing doesn't launch today... I'm going to be just, uh, <laughs> I'll be shocked. This is very unusual. For those of you that, that don't watch too many rocket launches, it is, it is, it is unusual to see a rocket, uh, not, you know, be able to go like a, scrubbing twice is quite unusual. Scrubbing three times, especially not having mechanical reasons to scrub. Um, you know, cause normally it's like, like for instance, la uh, last year or two years ago, last year, I think. Yeah. Uh, there was a Delta IV Heavy that sat on the pad and, you know, it had a couple tries and it had some problems. And then it actually scrubbed for a long time because they had to fix the issues. Um, this is obviously not the case here. This The rocket's ready to go, but it's been weather, weather, and then a range violation. So that's unusual. That's quite unusual. Um, <laughs> yeah, scrubbing through to exactly uh, Delta IV Heavy. Uh, all right. But, yeah, I hope not. Uh, for Musical Wolves, also hopes not. Hopefully this finally launches. Uh, it's the most number of tries before launch for Falcon 9. Uh, no, it's definitely not the most number of tries. If I remember right, this is just off the top of my head. I bet Trevor or some of the people that, that booster track everything 
Uh, I don't know if this is common data, but I, I think the most from my recollection would be SES 9. That would have been in 2016, I think. Yeah, I think that was early 2016. It might have been the first one of the full, thr full thrust that was after uh, the landing, I think. Man, I don't re quite remember. Um, yeah, but that it was right when they were starting to deal with the super cryogenic or the super chilled propellants like they use. Um, and there's a lot of people going, man, you're never going to figure out these super chilled props. It's not worth it, you know, because they SpaceX actually chills the propellants below what's standard, because obviously you have to chill oxygen down enough to get it to be liquid. You don't want it to be gaseous oxygen or else the tanks would need to be a thousand times bigger. The tanks would be a thousand times heavier. You'd have no payload. So you do have to have liquid oxygen uh, on board if you're using um, oxygen. But, uh, but yeah, that's quite unusual um, to actually chill it deeper into the cryogenic. So almost only a few degrees away from being a solid or, or closer to being a solid. That's how cold they, they, they chill down the oxygen. And they even chill down their RP-1, uh, I, think below, I think below freezing of water, like the freezing point of water. I believe the RP-1 is below freezing, which is unique because it also gains a little bit of density there. So it's, it's all worth it for that extra little bit of performance. So yeah. Um, I, if I recall, let's see here. I'm, I'm trying to see if SES had nine attempts. That's that's what people are seeing here um, in Discord. Uh, but I'm trying to remember if there was anything else. Um, all right, let's see. Let's keep going. Um, Space Geek says, are you concerned about the, the Carnival Elation cruise ship entering the danger zone now? I am not paying any attention to the... <laughs> to the exclusion zone maps and the marine traffic. Again, though... Uh, I hope this isn't the case for much longer, but in general, it is unusual for the marine traffic out there at Cape Canaveral to be, they're used to be able to come in and out of the port and go south. That's like for the last 50 years, that's what's been totally normal. Like even when a rocket's launching, it's normal to be able to get out there and go south because rockets normally do not fly south from Cape Canaveral. Uh, but that's now different. SpaceX has been choosing to fly south. Um, when their vehicle is is able to, to do a launch, like some of the Starlink missions are flying um, on what's known as the, the descending node uh, instead of the ascending node, just literally, even though it's worse performance and they still have to do a dog leg, it's just easier for them to, to not have to worry about the bad weather north in the winter. So they're actually flying south and just flying with less satellites. Um, and, and you can do that when you have Starlink like that because Starlink, you know, it's it's a fixed volume. You have a fixed amount that you can amount of performance the rocket can can do. And depending on other variables, you can literally just kind of like take out satellites if you don't have the performance for it. So that's literally what they're doing. And that's that's unique that they can do that because most payloads are like, no, this payload weighs this much. You can't like take a tenth of it off if you need to change trajectory. So that's unusual. Um, but yeah, here we are at the same. Hey. A stream is starting. That's good news. I, that's that's good news, right, guys? <laughs> uh, let me get this pulled up here um, in the background for you guys. We'll listen in here if there is still anything else. Um, yeah. <sighs> Come on. <laughs> All right. So, um, oh, I don't know if I put that one up there. Space Geek, by the way. Sorry if I if I didn't pop that up. Um, don't forget, guys, you don't have to do Super Chats. They, the Super Chats get thrown into our queue. If you have a good question, just in chat, just drop it in chat. And if our mod catches it, we'll throw it up here on screen. Um, so here's uh, from a good question from Nicola Canty uh, saying, um, my opinion on Ariane 6. Do you think it's going to be a good successor to Ariane 5? I'm going to be totally honest here. I know a little bit about Ariane 6. I know that uh, they're touting it to be, you know, a more competitive 21st century rocket that's, you know, able to compete with this new commercial market. Um, but I don't know. I haven't dove into it. I probably will. When it gets closer to launching, I'll probably do an Ariane 5 versus Ariane 6 and also compare it to some other rockets in its class. You know, I like doing that. And then at that point, I'll probably have a, a stronger opinion. Um, but in unless it's so they aren't planning to reuse the, you know, fully land boosters. You know, because they, they still have, um, are, are they planning to to catch the, the engines, though? I forget. Are they still planning to fly the engines back? I, I lost track if they were or not. For a little while, they had a detachable thrust section that was going to literally fly itself back. Ditch the tank, but just reuse the engines. Um, I don't think that's still the plan. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, so anyway, uh, 
I so I don't yeah I I think you know I think they're making a lot of effort to to make uh, a more cost uh you know cost competitive rocket. I have a feeling it'll continue to be not so much in the commercial sector of things. Um, yeah, th so there is um, smart on Vulcan, but Ariane 6 was going to have engines that flew back and actually had little wings. But yeah, there's smart reuse. There's Ace's upper stage for Vulcan, but then Ariane 6 actually had little wings and it was really cool. Let me let me look it up actually while we're while we're sitting right here. Uh, Arion 6 flyback. I don't know if that'll. Uh, maybe it was slightly different. Someone knows the answer right now. They're screaming. It's just a new second stage and different boosters is what someone's saying. So it still has the Vulcane engine, which would make sense. Um, yeah, that does not look much different other than boosters. Uh, but I want to find. Oh, here's. Here's what Airbus wanted to do. Hang on. I thought this was cool. I thought this was really cool. But, um, that was years ago. Okay, that was seven years ago. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll update my opinion here soon uh, once I dive into it more. But like I said, being perfectly honest, I, I haven't really looked into that um, in a while. So, uh, I'll get into that this year. But, um... Yeah, we've got a lot more questions, guys. Mods, you might have to slow down on picking good questions because this is gonna this would take all day, and we're <laughs> already getting into the stream, and I'm gonna shut up while SpaceX is streaming, and then I'll get back to you guys whenever it's feasible. So here we go. On your screen is a live view of Falcon 9 awaiting its 6.11 p.m. Eastern time launch from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Good evening and welcome to our launch coverage of Cosmos SkyMed second generation FM2 for our customer Talus Alenia Space. My name is Jesse Anderson and I'm a production and engineering manager for Falcon here at SpaceX and I'm joining you today from our SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. For those of you following along, you, you'll know that we had to stand down from our initial launch attempts due to unfavorable weather at the launch site. And for our last attempt yesterday, we had to stop the countdown just before T0 due to a ship in the hazard zone. Today, we are happy to report that weather is looking good, as you can see on your screen, and we are currently green on the range. With both the vehicle and satellite healthy, we began prop loading at T minus 35 minutes. So at the moment, we are looking good for an on-time liftoff today in just about T minus 11 minutes from now. Now, if you've been following along, you are likely familiar with today's payload, but for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, Cosmos SkyMed is an Italian Earth observation satellite designed to help monitor the environment, including the pre prevention and management of natural disasters. Owned by the Italian Space Agency and the Ministry of Defense, it is the, the first in a constellation of satellites to be operated for both civilian and military purposes. Here's more about the capabilities of the Cosmos SkyMed constellation. The Cosmos like Sky said, they, they do this every time. So this can be our, our little bit of time that you can watch us anytime. Um, this is a question that I've seen a lot. I wanted to bring it up from Hazadaza. Really want to know if the cruise ship got fined for breaching the range. So I'm pretty sure there is um, a governmental fine of some kind. Um, and a, probably a pretty good slap on the wrist for the captain. Um, but I don't know if... The, <laughs> I'm assuming that the fine would go to the government. I don't think that SpaceX recoups anything. I don't think they get some kind of compensation for someone else's negligence, which might change. I mean, that might have to change. If, if they are losing out on hundreds of thousands of dollars to reset a launch, um, you know, I'm pretty sure though that costs, you know, that's not free. <laughs> uh, all the range assets, all the people on console and all the personnel time, it's not free. It's, it's certainly expensive and having to, you know, continue the licenses and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I would imagine that in the future, we might actually see lawsuits coming out of private individuals and private companies uh, when there is delay like this. But I don't have the answers to that. Um, yeah, I I don't know. And I don't know if there is a way to find out. We'd probably hear about it if they do something like that. Um, let's see. This is Nick. Is there anything special about this mission compared to other Falcon 9 missions? So like I said in the pre-launch preview, it does have two things that I'm excited about. Number one, it is returning to launch site landing. So it's one that's landing back uh, on land, which always makes it more exciting. But the other thing that's really fun is that it's also uh, a bit of a twilight launch. So it's taking off 
uh, just after sunset. So it'll be getting kind of dark. It won't be super dark. It'll be getting dark. It'll be dusk, right? Um, and the rocket will be flying up into the illumination of the sun again. So it's, it's um, exhaust will actually be illuminated by the sun, which is really, really cool. So it just makes for a more uh, fun visual launch as well. So it just seems like a fun one to, to watch. So, and like I said, I said yes this yesterday, but uh, my good like friend from, f she was four days old, Caitlin Clark, who now works in the aerospace industry is out at the Cape for some work. She, this is, she's catching her first launch ever. So this is also special. Just knowing that I have a good friend out there um, on the beach, also with my other friend, the Nagels. So it's, it's a, uh, it's a whole party out there. Hi guys. The prime contractor responsible for the entire system. Here are a few words from their CEO, as well as the CEO of Telespazio, which designed and built the critical ground and in orbit support and operation. All right, we'll keep answering a few more questions. Like I said, you can find these videos anytime. Um, let's see, let's fly this thing. Hello, I hope we do. I hope it's a clear launch. Let's let's do this. Um, let's see, Brian wants to know, does my orange countdown clock correspond with range is red? No, the orange countdown clock is simply branding. That's just our brand color, orange. So don't be worried about the fact that it is orange. Maybe we, well, uh, I don't want to get into that because then we have to try to stay on top of it. I'd rather just listen to the experts about um, when things, um, yeah, is uh, <laughs> when things are happening, just hear it from them. Um, let's see. This is Wolfgang. Uh, how does it work with the fuel? Does it stay on the rocket for the next launch day or is it in another fuel tank? So um, I assume you're talking about recycling or a scrub. They can drain the fuel and the oxidizer and put it back into the ground support system. So back into the, the GSC, the ground support equipment. There's all these tanks out there at launch pads that are full of, you know, either fuel or nitrogen or helium or whatever, uh, you know, what other gases and, and propellants they need to put into the vehicle. So the Falcon 9 uh, will have nitrogen, has T-TEB, which I believe is loaded up outside of the ground support system. I think that's like loaded up before it's even rolled to the pad, but I'll have to be corrected on that. Uh, but it's loaded with nitrogen for the um, for the cold gas thrusters. It's loaded, loaded with helium, which is the way they uh, backfill the tank. So as you drain the tanks out of the out of the rocket, obviously if you had a sealed container like this and you start draining something, it's gonna start crumpling the tank because you're decreasing you know, the volume inside there. Uh, so they have to fill, they have to backfill that with with helium because helium is very undense and it's inert. So um, it can just fill those voids and, and keep the keep the tank under its uh, like three or five bar or whatever pressure it's at um, while it's sitting there. So minus six minutes from liftoff of the Falcon 9 carrying the Cosmos SkyMed satellite and we're progressing into the final stages of the launch countdown. Now the two-stage Falcon 9 vehicle stands 229 feet tall or slightly taller than a 21-story building. That bottom two-thirds of the vehicle is the first stage. Its objective is to accelerate the vehicle through the Earth's atmosphere to space and then separate from the rest of the vehicle. Above the first stage is the second stage, which has a single Merlin vacuum or MVAC engine, which ignites after the first stage separates. And the second stage is what will carry the Cosmos SkyMed satellite to a polar sun synchronous orbit. Now you'll notice at the top of the vehicle, what you're seeing on your screen is the fairing. Uh, and this is where we uh, hold our payload. Uh, it's safely enclosed inside of that payload fairing in front of you on your screen. And that is made of a carbon composite material. The fairing protects satellites on the way to orbit. Now the fairing uh, is jettisoned approximately three minutes into flight. And finally, the large trusted structure that you see there to the left of the, the vehicle. That is the TE to the left of the vehicle on your screen. Now we use that to roll the vehicle out to the pad and raise it to its vertical launch position. The TE also routes the vehicle's fluids, power, and telemetry umbilicals from the ground systems to the rocket and satellites until Falcon 9 goes on internal power and clears the pad. At liftoff, it will retract in order to clear the way for Falcon 9's ascent. And we're currently waiting for the TE retraction. And in preparation for that, the TE clamps will begin to open, which we should, which you should he see here. Actually, you can see it on your screen now. Those clamp arms just below the fairing are starting to open up. 
Once that completes, then the TE can finally retract away from the vehicle. Looks like the clamp arms have completed. Now the TE should start moving slowly away from the vehicle. The first stage is connected to a launch mount at the base of the TE, in the, but the structure is hinged and then will retract away from the vehicle in preparation for launch. I should take a moment here, confirm pointy end is up, flamey end is down. So they've got my go, which I know is extremely important. <laughs> Obviously. At this point in the countdown, both the first and second stages are nearly fully loaded with 1 million pounds of kerosene fuel and liquid oxygen. Both first stage and second stage should finish prop loading at about a minute apart from each other. Uh, first stage should finish up at T minus three minutes and second stage at T minus two minutes. And you can see some white clouds around Falcon stage 9. Stage one locks load is complete. We are that call out. Stage one locks load complete. Those white clouds around Falcon 9 is when the liquid oxygen meets the warmer ambient air in Florida there and condenses the air around it, causing those white clouds. At T minus 60 seconds, Falcon 9 will be in startup. That means that the rocket's autonomous internal flight computers have taken over the launch countdown. Just inside T minus two seconds, we light the Merlin M1D engines for liftoff. The Cosmos SkyMed satellite continues to be healthy and the Falcon 9 team is tracking no issues on the vehicle. Weather is still looking great. Some clear blue skies there over at Cape Canaveral and the range is green for launch. So with that, we are proceeding into the last few minutes of the terminal count. Yes, that is good news. That's what I like to hear from Jesse. As that you can see on your screen, we've got some great weather over there. Coming up on the completion of prop load on second stage. Stage two, locks load is complete. There we go. Stage two, locks load complete. That's funny. We're going to hear it here first, and then she'll probably repeat it because we're listening to the countdown net separately. Stage two, locks load is complete. And with that last call out, prop load is now complete on both stages. With that, you'll see some venting, and you can kind of see it on your screen there. We are now venting out the liquid oxygen that is in the lines on the transporter erector. That basically just clears the lines. There, you can get a good view of that. And then the next event will be the internal flight computers taking over the launch countdown about 15 seconds or so from now. Falcon 9 is in startup. Once the computers Falcon take over, they will execute stored programs and prepare the vehicle for liftoff. I will mute the other one because it is ahead Falcon by about 20 seconds. For launch. And great call out there. Falcon 9 is in startup now, just waiting the final call from the launch director here in a few seconds. Let's do this. Go for launch. Excellent news here. <laughs> All systems are go for launch. So let's listen into the terminal count and watch as Falcon 9 transports the Cosmos SkyMed satellite into orbit. This looks like it's going to be a beautiful launch. T minus 30 seconds. Oh, good luck, all my rocket photographer friends out there at the cave. I think you guys are going to have some stunning photos from tonight. This will be a great one. All right. Here we go, guys. I'll be quiet at T minus 10. We'll listen to the count and just. T minus 15 seconds. Hope this thing finally happens. And I'll stick around and answer some questions here later for you guys. So here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two, one, zero. Ignition and liftoff. In Volca and Lupo. Go Falcon, go Cosmo. Vehicle is pitching down range. M1D chamber pressures are nominal. There we go. Finally. Falcon 9 has successfully lifted off from Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, carrying the Cosmos SkyMed satellite to a polar sun synchronous orbit. Power and telemetry nominal. 
Now during ascent, we tilt the engines and that's what we call gimbling. And that turns the rocket horizontally. And that's what we call a gravity turn. We're still going up, but we're now also heading horizontally away from the launch pad. The rocket typically needs to go Falcon about- Falcon 9 is supersonic. We need to go about 17,500 miles per hour horizontally in order to avoid being pulled back down to Earth. Yeah, baby. 20, Max Q. Kilometers an hour. And there we heard the call out for Max Q. We have now passed through the maximum aerodynamic pressure. This is the largest structural load on the vehicle. And with that, we do have five events coming up back to back. They'll happen within seconds of each other. And these events include the first stage uh, making its way back to landing zone one today. So we'll have Miko, main engine cutoff, stage separation, a flip of the first stage, SES one is, or second stage engine start teleport. one, and then followed immediately by the boost back burn on the first stage. Again, that's five events happening within seconds of each other. We should get some good views of these happening. Again, that is Miko, oh, stage separation, S1 Vehicles flip. on a nominal trajectory. Good call outs there. So stage one flip, SES one, and the boost back burn coming up here in a few seconds. That shot is incredible. Are you kidding me? Because it's flying south, so it's being able to get tracked by the southern tracking station down there. Eco. Stage separation confirmed. And back to the Stage one, boost back startup. That's an incredible shot. And some incredible views from the ground cameras. We actually got to visually see Miko stage separation and see the first stage flip on your screen. That was incredible to see. Now what you're seeing on your screen on the left hand side is the first stage uh, currently in its boost back burn. That is the first of three burns to make its way back to land. And on your right hand screen, we do have the second stage engine lit up and so far looking really good on nominal trajectory. That was incredible. That's the greatest tracking shot. That's amazing. Stage one, boost back, shut down. And we heard that call out that the boost back burn has ended. Now in a few seconds here, we should see the fairing halves on the second stage being deployed. We've got some awesome views here. The left-hand screen is showing the first stage with the grid fins deploying on your screen. Fairing separation confirmed. Oh, I wanted to see that shot from the tracking camera. That'd be really cool. And we heard that call out and visual confirmation on your right-hand screen that the fairing halves have deployed. They're now making their way back to Earth and we will attempt to recover them with our recovery vessel named Bob today. Incredible views today. Got some great ground views of the vehicle as it is making its ascent. And we are T plus four minutes and 23 seconds into today's mission. And we're currently in the first of two planned MVAC burns for satellite deployment. Now, T plus six minutes and 11 seconds, you should see on your screen the first stage is entry burn. That entry burn will be the second of three burns needed to make its way back to landing zone one today. Now, for the entry burn, we relight three of the nine M1D engines. And that starts with the center E9 engine followed by the E1 and E5 engines. And that helps to slow the vehicle down as it passes back into the Earth's atmosphere. And we need to slow the vehicle down to reduce- Both vehicles continue to follow nominal trajectories. Great call outs, everything's looking nominal. And for that entry burn, we do need to slow down the, the vehicle uh, to reduce the re-entry forces. Uh, that helps us to recover and reuse the first stage. You can see on your left hand screen, those grid fins that opened up those help to guide the vehicle back as it makes its way to its landing target. And again, today we are attempting to land at landing zone one. This is back at land. We need three burns to get us there. We've already completed the boost back burn and we're coming up on the entry burn here in just under 30 seconds. 
Still can't get over that tracking shot. We're going Stage to two is still looking great. To on your right hand thing. screen is a view of the MVAC engine on the second stage. Stage one, entry burn startup. Here we go. So it's slowing down so the atmosphere doesn't tear it apart. We heard the point. call out and you can visually see on your screen that the entry burn has begun on the first stage. Again, this helps to slow the vehicle down as it re-enters back into the Earth's atmosphere. It's only about a 20 second burn. Stage one, entry burn shut down. And we heard that call out for entry Stage burn. Stage two FTS has saved. Heard the call out that the entry burn has completed, and you can see that the engines have shut down on your left hand screen. That is two of the three burns. The last burn will be the landing burn. You can see in the background Stage of your left. Stage one FTS has saved. <laughs> you can... Vehicles are on nominal trajectories. Good call outs there, and you can see the land in the background view of the first stage as it's making its way back to landing zone one. Stage one, transonic. Wow. Beautiful. Stage one, landing burn. The landing oh. burn, wow. Incredible views of this landing burn of this first stage. Let's see if we can touch down on landing zone one today. Oh, but the cape is getting some incredible views. Stage one, landing like the floor. Stage one, landing like the floor. And what an incredible sight to see. We have touchdown of Falcon 9 at landing zone one. This is our 104th recovery of an orbital class Terminal rocket. Guidance. And that includes first stage landings for both Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. And speaking of Falcon Heavy, today's flight marks the first time that we have reconfigured a Falcon Heavy side booster to a Falcon 9 mode, which is pretty awesome. Now, next up, we will have the shutdown of the MVAC on the second stage. It's coming here in about 10 seconds. And that is called Seco 1, or second stage engine cutoff 1. That was amazing. Tico one. They make it look so easy. Just heard that call out for Seco one. Just waiting for Nominal a orbit insertion. And there it is. We got a confirmation of good orbit. Now the mission isn't over just yet. The second stage is now embarking on its first coast phase. And after the coast phase, we will light that MVAC engine for a second time around T plus 56 minutes. So we'll see you back here in about 45 minutes. And in the meantime, enjoy the space tunes. Well, my friends, I guess that's why we uh, got lots of time here to, to be able to talk about first off. What a freaking launch. That was beautiful. I saw that SpaceX already tweeted uh, about that, and I I want to I'm gonna make Elon give us the full cut of that of that that tracking camera. It's just, hang on. Wow. That was insane. <laughs> oh, I was just to say, we demand to see the shot in full resolution from launch through fairing separation. That was the most epic shot ever. Let's see it. Um. That was just incredible. 
man. Yep, I hope we see that in full resolution, in slow motion, because that was one of the greatest shots I've seen in a long time. Wow. So, yeah, the reason why that was extra special, guys, let me see if I can pull this up here. Uh, give me a second. I'll, I'll, I'll try and find you guys where the tracking stations exactly are. Uh, NASA camera tracking stations. Cape Canaveral. Uh, give me a second here. Um, map. I, I know there's a, an image showing all of the where all the tracking assets are. And they go way down the Cape. They go down to uh, Edward, Edwards. Or what's it called? Uh, gosh, it's been a while. I'm trying to see if I can find that. I know I've seen it before. Discord, if you guys see anything, let me know. Uh... Where are all those? Here we go. Is this one? That's a terrible looking image. <laughs> but the cool thing is, so yeah, because this rocket flew mostly south for this launch, um, it flew, uh, there's a tracking station that is south, and normally that tracking station doesn't have great views, but you know, you want to have as much parallax and as many different angles of launches as you can. In case there is an anomaly, those tracking assets can help answer a lot of questions. So what they, you know, what you want to do is you want to have them spread out um, up and down the coast, but normally rockets launch northish or northeast and you know or, or due east, and they get further and further away from the camera. With this launch, though, it literally flew a little bit east to get out over the ocean, and then mostly just flew straight south, or for more or less straightish south. So it actually was getting closer and closer to that tracking asset which is just puts on the best show. And I'm trying to find that map that shows all the tracking cameras. Um, range tracking camera map. Let's see, is this one? That's a tiny thing. Uh, nope, that's not it either. I know someone's going to find it out there. Discord, I'm relying on you guys. You'll find it. Let me answer a couple more questions, uh, including a thank you to, to John for 14 months of membership. That is awesome. Thank you so much. Man, um, hopefully we get something awesome to share and talk about in the next, uh, maybe the next Patreon live stream. We can all be nerding out about that shot that we just saw. Uh, let's see. Um, with these uh, polar, uh, with these Florida polar launches, will launches from California Vandenberg stop? I hope not. No. Uh, so it takes a pretty big payload penalty to be able to, it has to be a very lightweight satellite to be able to do this maneuver. Um, they don't have enough performance out of the Falcon 9 to be able to do all launches from the Cape. Uh, they can do, uh, like we're seeing a handful of them in like those transporter missions. And I think just because they have such a well-oiled machine out there at the Cape and the, the teams are so, you know, well, well oil, oiled is the best way to put it. They just know what they're doing. Um, so well that it's just easiest for them to launch out of there. I guarantee it's it's just cheaper. They have all the operations out there. They have the refurbishment centers. They just know what they're doing. Um, I think they just plain and simple prefer to launch from the Cape when, when there's enough performance to do so. The meaning when the satellite is light enough and when it is, um, yeah, when, when there is that kind of, um, yeah, that kind of performance for the Falcon 9. So if it is a heavier thing, that that's not going to be an option to be able to fly from the East Coast. Um, yeah, so uh, there will still be Vandenberg. I mean, there's a Vandenberg launch on Wednesday at this point. So, um, And it's likely, I, I, I can check our pre-launch preview here, but I'm pretty sure it's a lot heavier uh, than, than this one is. And that's probably exactly why. And sometimes, you know, with certain payloads and stuff so the one flying this weekend is i don't think we have a, a payload mess yet classified but it's likely a lot heavier than 2200 kilograms so um all right let's keep answering um i saw one and i don't know if i missed it or something i thought it was interesting would have liked to kind of talk about it just for fun um uh do they repaint the fairings i don't think they repaint the fairings does anyone no i don't think they do um, they, they're pretty beat up looking and they get pretty dark. So, um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think they, they do repaint them. They don't repaint the boosters. That's for sure. That's why they're so stinking dark. Uh, yeah. Uh, when will we see another Falcon heavy launch? We will see one, I think net March or April. Uh, that's going to be that, that U S air force, I believe U S, uh, AF 44 or something like that. And, uh, let me see. Oh, let me see NASA space flights reentry burn shot. I bet this is great. Um, wow. 
Hey, I'm going to pull this up here for you guys. And we're going to take a look at this because this is really cool. My friends over at NASA Space Flight have great team of photographers, videographers, and I'm going to just check this out. Hang on. I'm pulling this up here for you guys. One second. Look at this tracking shot of entry burn of Falcon 9. Wow, the coolest thing is you can still see it because it's still high enough that it's illuminated by... Wow, that is quite the shot. That is incredible. This would have been quite the launch to see. My parents were actually on the uh, on the Gulf Coast, and, and I'm... She says, my mom said, amazing from even so far away. There were others on the beach watching, even from the, the Gulf Coast, the opposite coast of Florida. That's so cool. Uh, glad that it put on such a show for all of Florida down there. Man, I wish I would have gone down for this one. Uh, but yeah, the next, sorry, the next Falcon Heavy, man, I'm <laughs> very distracted right now. I'm just seeing all this footage. The next Falcon Heavy launch is uh, not for a few months, uh, but there's supposedly up to five this year. I'm expecting to see more like three. Um, would be my guess. It's net March, but we don't know. Um, I think I'm guessing like April. Who knows? Um, hopefully it'll be really fun. Scrub and launch is the same word in Swedish. Well, that's not good. <laughs> Glad we have separate words here in the US because in English, because that, uh, yeah, that'd be bad. Uh, let's see here. Uh, could SpaceX just use the ship for Starship's Earth to Earth? Okay, so this is, a, yeah, uh, Donna Harvey. The, uh, could SpaceX just use the upper stage of, of Starship uh, for Earth-to-Earth -Earth transportation? And that is what Elon has been saying he wants to do with Starship ultimately, is, is a point-to-point -point transportation system. Uh, I've got people getting all up in my face about saying that that'll never happen. And they forget that, like, Starship is, is like almost like a new type of vehicle. It's not one vehicle. There's going to be a Starship Lunar Lander. There's the, you know, there's a super heavy booster that launches different variants, a, a tanker, a cargo version, a crew version of a Starship. And I believe one of those versions someday, or at least what SpaceX would like it to be, is an, a point-to-point -point transporta transportation system on Earth. So you can literally get in this in a rocket, um, single stage. It's not single stage to orbit because it wouldn't be orbit. I think the current... What most calculations put it at is like something like 4,000 kilometers or something would be its maximum range um, with just the upper stage, something like that. So pretty far, you know, you could do many trips uh, like that. You know, that's what is that? Uh, 2,400 miles or so. Um, pretty close to a cross country trip in the U.S. Um, but, you know, maybe shorter Atlantic hops or something like that. It could be possible, too. And you could get somewhere in like 30 minutes. That would be pretty awesome. Please sign me up for that when that is a possibility. So yeah, that is, I mean, Elon's talked about it even more recently saying that he does hope that that's still a possibility and that they would not use the booster for those. Uh, just economically, it makes most sense to fly it um, as, as one stage in that case. So, um, oh, uh, Corona Kibo, did you find what I've been looking for? Hang on, I'm opening up. Okay, here we go. Corona Kivo, you nailed it, I believe. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. Let me, let me get this pulled up here for everybody else because you, my friend win. Okay. So let me pull this up. This is great work. Um, this is a little bit here of the, the camera configurations on the Cape. So this rocket took off here today. Um, just kind of right above, uh, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but let me zoom in a little more. The rocket took off here. Um, let's see. Cape, so this is Kennedy KSC, Kennedy Space Center. Go down to the green star that says uh, USC-3. That's really close to Slick 40. Um, so, and that's where the rocket took off. So kind of in between this dotted blue line, and uh, which is funny, it's at 51.6 degrees. So they're showing the, oh, that's the Apollo Beach cameras way up there. Wow. Ponce Inlet. Oh, wait. Wow, the Apollo Beach is way up there? I thought it was way down here. Um, but anyway, the 51.6 degree launch angle, that's the, the normal launch. Most launches are around that same one because a lot of those, that's where the International Space Station is. When Starlink tends to launch, uh, normally that's where they tend to launch is at that 51.6 degree, that dashed blue line. But this one launched more or less from, we'll just say that green star below that, and it flew south. And so what it actually did is it flew right past, see this black one down there is the uh, PGOR, that's Patrick's Air Force Base tracking site. 
And that's quite a bit further south, uh, further south than Cocoa Beach, downtown Cocoa Beach and stuff like that even. So um, that's exactly what that was. Um, that's probably where that camera came from. These cameras are incredible. And let me tell you guys, we have been putting a lot of effort into, oh, there's the WB57. Oh, that's so cool. This is an awesome PDF. Great find. Discord, thank you. And Corona Kivo, thank you. We're not going to be competing with this anytime soon, but I did want to let you guys know that we have some, I'm going to say next level tracking solutions here coming up for uh, for out at Starbase. We have we have some stuff that just arrived that I think is going to, I mean, our goal is literally to do what SpaceX just did, that, that shot that SpaceX had. And we think we have a solution that's going to be pretty darn close so even live because that's the hard part in post you can always smooth stuff out you can you know you can track a camera better in post um but you know it, it's absolutely incredible that uh there's tracking so or c computers and stuff like this the, the models that we're going to be looking at that we're using that we have now uh, should be accurate enough that we can track it that smoothly in in real life so i'm really hoping for that so we should have some pretty incredible uh starship tracking shots uh we'll name the kit <laughs> we'll we'll name the kit and uh I'll show you guys in in the next uh Patreon feed. I don't remember if I showed you guys yet, but we did we did actually get some awesome 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 gear <laughs> that I'm really excited for. So, um yeah. All right, let me keep answering questions here for you guys instead of me just ranting on about that. Um it will be awesome. I can't wait. Let's see. Um uh Okay, so this is about the James Webb Space Telescope orbit from zero zero. Um, may I ask a question? If there's if there is a time to pass this question, why does James Webb Space Telescope uh, need to orbit L two point instead of just staying in the middle of L two as a stationary object? So uh, who's I just saw? I think it was uh, Launchpad Astronomy or someone had a really 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 good video about this exact topic. Um, I would like to defer to them. Uh, they had just a, an incredible video about it, but but long story short, um, it's actually more stable to be able to uh, to basically be in that motion as opposed to constantly station keeping around. Uh, and, and yeah, also it needs sunlight. It needs to. It can't if it's directly in the center. You'd actually would be in the shadow of of Earth, and you would it needs sunlight for its solar panels. Um, but also, it is a little bit more stable to be in these weird like orbiting nothing basically, which is really really confusing. So that video is great. I highly recommend it. Um, this is from uh, Luke Lamont. Where are the Electron and the other models from? Uh, so th all these models are from different manufacturers, from the companies themselves, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that's actually why I'm so excited that we are working on, uh, because all of, none of these are to scale, which really frustrates me. Like the Delta IV Heavy uh, is the same height in real life as Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, almost exactly. I think it's... 72 meters tall versus 70, uh, five meter wide cores versus 3.7 meter wide. So it's a lot wider. It's a little bit taller. Um, it is larger. Uh, but, the, you know, the Electron in real life is only about the size of the landing legs of Falcon 9 or something. It's it's much smaller. So I wish that these that all my rockets were to scale. And because of that, that's actually why we're, we're working on our own Falcon 9 model rockets. These are this is the prototype, one of the prototypes. Um, and these are actually one 100 scale. We're going to be making, and this is metal. It's like solid as a rock. You can undo the, the grid fins. The grid fins move and deploy, and you can turn them and do different things like that. The legs, we can take the legs in on these and everything. Uh, these are going to be pretty legit. I think you guys are really going to like these rockets. Um, they're not just some, uh, you know, absolutely no offense to uh, any of the other rockets that I own because I, I love all of them. Um, but the, the problem is always, oh, they're either totally bespoke, so they're really expensive. Someone has to hand assemble them, um, or they're fragile or and expensive or both. And my goal with this has been able to mass produce. I want to get um, a whole rocket collection that are all on the same 1-100 scale. So you can see a Falcon 9 next to a space shuttle, next to the N1, next to uh, a Soyuz, next to Falcon Heavy, next to Delta IV Heavy, and have a whole collection of rockets that are all at 1-100th scale. And I like that they're 1-100th, because then you just know, oh, look it, this thing is 70 centimeters tall. That means it's 70 meters tall. You know, nice, easy conversions. Um, and I think it's going to be pretty awesome. And I, I'm really excited, too. 
Uh, we had to make a little minor tweaks to our packaging, so this is not the final packaging. Uh, but it's going to be pretty awesome, honestly, guys. And uh, we're going to have a mailing list come out in a couple weeks for those of you that are interested in pre-orders. Uh, before we get into the and once we know the final price, which we're getting into here in, in the next couple of weeks, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be, uh, I think, a really high end thing, not a kit, a high end model that you don't have to assembly, no assembly required, uh, and we'll do a founder's edition on them as soon as we have everything figured out. We're, I like to think we're about two and a half or three months away from from actually shipping. I hope manufacturing is hard, but yeah, stay tuned. I'll, I'll be tweeting about that here in the near future. Um, you guys will be able to sign up for a mailing list to be the first to know. And then eventually, once we kind of have a, an idea for sure, uh, then we'll probably even take pre-orders on some of them for those of you that want the Founders Edition. So there you go. Um, hopefully, you can have a, a better collection than this. And I'll be replacing most of these probably with um, with a same, same collection like that because I want them all to be in scale. It really bugs me that they're not. <laughs> uh, all right. Craig Johnson. Other than replacing the nose cone with a payload, what else would be needed to convert a side booster into a Falcon stage? Uh, that's a good question. For the most part, they're actually the same. You'd have to remove uh, the octawebs, and, and the actual hold-on clamps are slightly different from Falcon Heavy to Falcon 9. Uh, the Falcon Heavy cores only actually can be held on by three places um, because there's, uh, the, you know, if you think about how the normally there's four hold-downs on a rocket uh, on the Falcon 9. Uh, when you have, and then... The Falcon Heavy has uh, six, eight altogether. So there's only three on the boosters and, and two in the center. Then that, that's it. So you have to change out that so that it has the right amount of uh, hold downs. You also don't have the cross braces and the things that, that hold the, the boosters together. You don't have that up at the top either. So they had to remove some of that hardware. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's, for the most part, the actual tank system, I believe, is relatively the same. Obviously, the engines are the same, landing legs are the same, grid fins pretty much the same. Um, yeah, so that's uh, pretty. Uh, I think that's what I what I can think of that they had to do. But it has been think about it. It's been almost three years. Well, two and a half years since they last flew Falcon Heavy, and this is the first flight they had of it. So I don't know if it sat around for a long time or not. But it must have had a, a bit more time in the shop than a, a normal refurbishment. So. Uh, let's see here. This is from uh, Protocol OH. Thank you. Uh, have I ever had a chance to meet or talk? I have not met John Insprucker yet in person. I have seen him from like across the room. Have not been able to shake that gentleman's hand. That is someone that I would really like to meet and talk to. I'd... Okay, they just had, yeah, just, t sorry, hearing comms. Uh, yeah, he is a legend. I would love to talk to him about his days with the Delta, the Delta program. I mean, it would be amazing. So, uh, when will the... Um, this is from Adrian the floor. When will be the chopsticks test? Uh, I mean, they're obviously doing chopstick testing right now. For those of you unfamiliar, SpaceX is practicing picking things up with their uh, tower out there, stage zero as it's called at Starbase. They have these giant arms that they lovingly re that Elon lovingly calls the chopsticks. And uh, yeah, those are currently practicing just picking up weights. And in the future, I I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see them get the booster back out there and do some kind of fit test and all that kind of stuff uh, relatively soon and picking up, you know, hopefully picking up the boost, maybe the booster and picking up starship with those chopsticks would be an awesome test. So I would love to see that in the next couple of weeks. So yeah, we will see. Um, let's see here. Ricardo Vega. This is a great question. Is there any footage of Apollo astronauts inside the lunar lander? I know there's photos. I've seen photos of them uh, in their little sleeping arrangements. Very curious to know how objects behave in lun lunar gravity, for example, pouring water into a glass. That would be amazing. I don't know if there is footage like that. Um, yeah, that's definitely something that this next generation of people have to do. This next generation of uh, Artemis astronauts will need to spend more time because uh, they're going to be potentially on the, the lunar surface for two weeks as opposed to uh, the most time on the moon during the Apollo program is Apollo 17, and I think it was only three days. So, you know, greatly extending the amount of time on the moon, therefore greatly extending time to do um, less EVAs. You know, the EVAs are pretty intensive during the Apollo program, the extravehicular activities uh, with little rest. And the time that they were inside was was resting. So, you know, there weren't wasn't that much time for things like that. But I would love. Um, yeah. Um, this is true. Good reminder here from Johnny. Thank you for the uh, for the tip. But yes, you're right. Patience is. 
So this is, you know, and, and apparently there's been not some pressure, but just kind of a gentle reminder from NASA, who is a, a major customer of SpaceX, is one of the, one of their biggest customers, you know, gently reminding them, I'm really excited that you have 50 launches on the table this year. Make sure you don't get go fever and make sure that you're still giving each and every launch the attention and the patience that they all deserve because you do not want to get go fever and start rushing launches. Um, yeah. So hopefully, hopefully it seems like, you know, obviously SpaceX uh, obeyed the criteria and hopefully the operations on the day-to-day -day side on integrations and things like that are, are continuing to be nice and tight because we do not want to see any uh, issues that just sets everything back. Uh, thank you for the tip from Bomba World. Um, oh, that's awesome. Uh, okay, so this is from um, John Depker, who is a, a super tip. Also owns the full flow stage combustion cycle shirt. Thank you so much. Uh, good, good launch to see. I love it. Um, not sure if this has been discussed yet, but could you explain the solar orbit? So sun synchronous orbits are those that are always in constant contact and in con the, they're flying with the sun at the same relative angle. So um, now this is something I don't quite understand. I don't think they're all always in a halo around like, you know, if, if you are the sun and I'm the earth, I don't think they're always flying like this, but I think they're just always flying in the exact same relative angle. So, you know, it could be like this. It could be like this. It could be right at noon. So as it's flying, it's always lined up with noon because it's directly you know, lined up with the sun. Um, and the reason that it's slightly back is because of, what is it, uh, orbital precession and some weird angular momentum stuff? I don't quite remember. I, I needed, I, I will be doing a video this year, I promise, about orbital mechanics and just kind of explaining all orbits. And sun synchronous orbit is one that I want to study more so I can explain it better because I'm actually, yeah, definitely not, Scott Manley would know a lot better how to answer that one uh, than I would for sure as he does most things. <laughs> uh, but sensor organized orbit is one that I, I don't quite, it's, it's similar to polar orbit, but it's um, because of its unique uh, angle and the, the whole orbital precession thing, it stays relative to the sun every day. So uh, yeah, they're in this, they're in line with the sun each 24 hours at least. And yes, there is a precession. Okay. It's the same place at the same time of solar day each day. There we go. Yep. Something like that. I'll have to do a video on how exactly it works because it is confusing to me too. Uh, this is a great question, Ziggy. This is the the script that I'm working on right now as we speak. And actually, it's, it's going to be a collaboration with Scott Manley. So uh, we are currently editing another video. I'm working on a script. We're going to answer that exact question. Why isn't nuclear propulsion mainstream in the rocket industry? For commercials, it doesn't make sense. But for big, you know, when we're talking interplanetary missions at def or lunar missions even, it, it can start to make sense there. Yeah. All right, this is uh, uh, Alice, launch or landing site for Super Heavy. So um, I think that's a question. Thank you, Alice. Uh, the, uh, currently, the launch and landing site for Super Heavy will be at Starbase. At least that's the plan, assuming they get all the permissions and everything ends up going well out there with the rest of the infrastructure. Uh, they do plan to launch and land from there. They also plan to have a launch and landing site at Kennedy Space Center, which would be awesome, at 39A. Uh, historic 39A, where you know all the Saturn Vs took off from, um, and the majority of the space shuttle missions as well. But uh, you know the the ultimate dream, you know, and what SpaceX has already bought is some old oil rigs, and they do plan to refurbish oil rigs and put launch towers and launch infrastructure and landing infrastructure on those as well, and that would allow them to be able to push those out to, out to sea, keep them out there, literally probably fly the boosters and Starship to there, land there, fuel them up launch them and go. And that way they would be able to avoid a lot more restrictions. Also open up a few extra orbital capabilities. I mean, how cool would it be? Think about, think about this, like genuinely let yourself have this idea. Someday they could have a payload land, uh, you know, to get integrated into Starship and be integrated at Starbase, right? Where they put the payload inside of Starship. Then Starship actually hops out to the sea, right? and lands on the launch platform where it's already there's already a booster there. It gets integrated onto the booster out at sea and then is able to take a totally different trajectory from there. Uh, I don't know if that's ever going to be that necessary, that beneficial, because I don't I don't know. But that I mean, just think about that as a possibility, you know. Uh, it'd be pretty crazy to see something like that happening. But because how else are you going to get those rockets out to sea besides just flying them out there? But who knows? All right. Uh, hi, I live in North Sweden. 
Uh, and currently building an orbital launch pad in Karuna. First one in Europe, Ariane is going to use it to test reusable tech. That's really cool. I did not realize that they were planning to test reusable tech from Sweden. That's amazing. That'll be super fun. I hope it's as exciting as, uh, as watching some of the Starbase stuff because that's hard to beat. So, yeah. Uh, we got this in just in time, Jim. Thank you so much for the tip. Um, let's see. We And, and Nishat, hope, uh, Nishant, hopefully we answered this for you. We talked about how they refurbished the Falcon Heavy booster to be a single vehicle. Hopefully you, you caught that. Um, let's see. This is from... Um, from Don Deep Lodaya. Sorry if I slaughtered your name there. Uh, has there been a cost analysis on what it will take to get the second stage to be reused? Can extra fuel and tiles um, on Starship be used on them, as in on the Falcon 9? Um, so I did a video about this a long time ago about, you know, why can't you reuse the second stage on a Falcon 9? Uh, long answer short is really, you really cut into the payload capability of the Falcon 9. You start getting it into a class of you know, it's a lot of engineering. It's not just like stick some tiles on here, give it more fuel. You have to think about the things like you can't light this engine at sea level. You can't use it as a landing engine because it's too vacuum optimized. It would, it would have flow separation. Uh, so you can't use the Merlin vacuum nozzle uh, at sea level. So you can't do propulsive landing with it. Uh, then if you want to attach other engines, that adds a lot of extra weight. And every pound or kilogram that you add to your second stage is a pound or a kilogram that you take away from your payload capability. This thing only has, like, the most it launches these days, I think it's 16,800 kilograms. So if you add another three tons just for an, an additional propulsion system capable of making it land, you took three tons away from orbit. Then if you add another two tons worth of heat shields, now you all of a sudden have added, you know, taken away another two tons. You start stripping away the capabilities. Also, um, don't forget, the biggest thing with second stage reentry compared compared to first stage reentry, second stage is going about four times faster than the first stage. Now you might think, okay, four times faster, so what? Does that mean four times as much heat that it has to, uh, you know, take in? No, it actually experiences a lot more than four times the heat. It doesn't go up linear. It's not four times faster, you get four times as much heat. It's not even squared. So four times faster, 16 times as much heat. It's cubed. The amount of heat that a vehicle will experience from velocity forces from compressing air uh, is is the relation the, the relation to the heat is cube to the velocity, so that means four times four times four, yeah. So sixty four times more heat is what this thing can see compared to this. So that's a lot hotter. It's a lot more work. By the time you engineer in all of these extra things to try to make a second stage landing, you're cutting off on the capability, and it's a system that this, this rocket's wanting to retire. They don't want to fly this thing any more than possible. So they should might as well stop wasting their R&D and, you know, because think about how many people would have to engineer, how much testing, how much all of these other things would have to go into making that happen when all of those people and time and effort and research and development dollars could be going into Starship, which is, you know, once Starship's online, this thing's going to look like a joke, you know, and so the sooner they get Starship online and can fly things cheaper, faster, bigger, heavier things, uh, there will there'll eventually will be no point to Falcon 9. Eventually, you know, the, the goal of Starship is to make vehicles like Falcon 9 completely obsolete, right? So, you know, um, it'd be silly for them to waste research and development and, and time and money and effort and headaches and all of that stuff just to be able to reuse a second stage for now. So, um, yeah, but there was actually a little talk for a, there was a minute where Elon's like, ah, we're going to practice around making basically baby Starships for the second stage of Falcon 9 and using that to practice reentry, but he backed up on that and it's just like, nah, let's just make Starship. Uh, thank you to uh, Radius for becoming a member. Don't forget, we will be doing a member stream. I think I might be able to do a member stream this Saturday, uh, which we will continue our James Webb Space Telescope in Kerbal Space Program and just help answer other questions and hang out. Those are always really fun. Uh, don't forget if you are a pilot or above as well on Patreon, we always do uh, a, an additional live stream for pilots and aboves on the same day. They're beforehand. And there we kind of talk a little more shop. Those people get a lot more like one-on-one -on -one attention. We really talk a lot more about just um, a lot more things that I'm working on kind of behind the scenes. Uh, and because, you know, those are the, our biggest supporters. So if you want to help me do what I do and also have some fun little perks for yourself, Head on over to patreon.com slash everyday astronaut uh, or become a YouTube member. That's another way to get into some of these live streams as well. So I don't try to keep them out. It's not like a gatekeeping thing. I, you know, 
I want to do as much stuff for free, but it's as a way for me to give back to those people that allow me to do this. You know, it's, it's Patreon and YouTube members and super chats and stuff like this that allows me to do this full time, pay the web staff, pay Andrew and Casper who are currently editing videos as we speak and, and, and then invest in things like the, you know, Mars studio B where I think we're going to make you guys really happy by the time they do orbital launches. I really think you guys are going to love it. And we're doing that so we can do our best job of capturing history and preserving it. So Hope you guys are stoked on that because I obviously am. Uh, Jeff Lightburn says, uh, hey, Tim, is there an update for the FCC license for the Starship Orbital Test? I believe you're thinking FAA. There is a separate radio license that will need to be. I think they actually already have the FCC license, if I recall. But the FAA license right, right now, the environmental impact is the big one that's that's being debated. Um, the FAA, don't forget, the FAA isn't actually certifying a vehicle per se. They're literally worried about, does this vehicle have a chance of risking people or property, right? What are the chances that this vehicle, uh, you know, will go off and, and blow up a hotel on South Padre Island? That'd be horrible. That'd be a tragedy, a disaster, an avoidable disaster. So that's their job is to make sure, is this thing safe uh, to be anywhere near the public, right? And uh, we're hoping to hear a final update from them by the end of February is the last we heard. Uh, but even so, you know, I've, I can't believe how many people, guys, this this is uh, kind of frankly wild to me that people are like, the, FCC, the FAA is holding up SpaceX and Super Heavy test. No, they're not. <laughs> Super Heavy's got a... Super Heavy's got a long ways to go, guys, and and the orbital test has got a long ways to go before it's it's ready. They are not holding up anything. I'm glad. I'm really glad that SpaceX is, has been putting pressure on the FAA so that they aren't the ones totally holding them up. Um, but if if you really genuinely think that uh, SpaceX would be ready to launch today, and they're just waiting for the FAA launch license, you are just simply mistaken. And a lot of people, unfortunately, saw that big push in uh, last July or last August or when I think it was last August. Uh, when they had like teams of, it was just the big giant reckoning, you know, there is the, the big push uh, to get the vehicle stacked. And, and that was awesome. That was really exciting. It, a lot of just everyone was like, holy cow, you know, look at how much they got done in the last two weeks. And it's like, yeah, because they pulled people from every team to, to get as much done as possible so they could, you know, stack a vehicle and really start putting some pressure on the FAA and also to really just start getting some stuff moving. Cause sometimes when you start moving dirt, start, you know, pushing buttons and doing all the things, you start actually problem solving for things further down the road. So now we're into that further down the road part where we're seeing them have to backtrack on some things and fix and, and tidy up some other things. I still am in the personal opinion, even when I saw B4 being built, it just felt very rushed. And I honestly, I always thought it was a mock-up. I always thought it was a, a low fidelity non-flight unit. Um, you know, they've been saying otherwise, but I, I won't be surprised at all. It, you know, now it's kind of got some aero covers and all these things and, it's a little bit higher fidelity looking, uh, but I still feel like it's mostly a fit test for them. And I wouldn't be surprised if we only see it do some wet dress rehearsals um, because I just I, I don't quite see a lot of data and a lot of value from 29 version one Raptors when version two Raptors are in production as we speak. I, I think, in my opinion, it's, it feels more like they'll probably go into uh, a Raptor two variant uh, that will actually be the first one to fly. That's my opinion. You're happy to have your own opinion on such. So, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm curious, though. Don't forget, I did that Twitter poll at the beginning of the year. Uh, I wish I had included, what do you think would be the first super heavy in Starship to fly? Um, ooh, Elon liked my tweet. I hope he sends it. I hope he sends that video out. Oh, man, because that was such an awesome shot. I really hope he's calling someone up being like, hey, guys, we got we got to post this full quality video. Because it was so awesome. <laughs> Discord, you guys are funny. All right. Uh, Michael uh, Tene or Teeny or something. Also, thank you for becoming a member as well. I appreciate that. Um Let's see. Really, this is this is cool. This is from uh, Nico D uh, Nicodemo saying, she said in in Boca Alupo in Italian in the mouth of the wolf. It's a good way of saying good luck. Falcon Nine should have replied, uh, "Che crepi," or I hope it dies. <laughs> Interesting. I that's thank you so much for uh, for giving us some Italian knowledge there. That's awesome. 
And thank you also for the generous donation. Um, Austin, can you do a uh, video doing a deep dive into the flight control software, the nitty gritty on how it's programmed and how they compensate for the elements? That is actually one that would be probably really, really, really hard to get answers on because that gets really close to weapon systems. Like that is, you know, rockets are already delineated from missiles and intercontinental ballistic missiles. You know, they're basically already, uh, there's some walls around the technology in rockets and the guidance is one of those that's very closely guarded. So that might be the hardest one to make a, a video on. I could talk to people that know a decent amount about that kind of stuff, like Joe Barnard, who's good at, at knowing how to navigate in space, not in space, but he's never had anything in space, but navigate in a relative space, right? Um, what types of things they can do. You know, we know they can use accelerometers and, and gimbals and GPS, unlocked GPS units and things like that. Um, but how exactly they combine it all, the nitty gritty of it is stuff that I don't know, stuff I've never come across. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would love, uh, I would love to know too. So if, if I ever see that pop up, I will gladly teach you guys everything. Now the th I could do something on older systems. Like there's, there's some old archival videos of the Atlas five system. The crazy thing about original Atlas fives, I think uh, it's been, it's been years since I've done this, uh, looked this up, but if I remember right, the guidance was mostly done on the ground and beamed up to the rocket because the computing power to actually know where it's at and know its trajectory and stuff was just too much. So the original like Atlas, uh, SM 65 a and stuff like that was most of the ground, like the, the data and the, the processing was actually done on the ground because they couldn't get those computers on a rocket without totally destroying. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, technical videos on radio laser acceleration and, and new starlight tracking is publicly available. Um, yeah, we'll see. So we'll see. Okay. Um, this is a good question here from, um, pot kettle saying what is venting on the MVAC above the gas generator tubing great question so a lot of times you'll see on uh MVAC here let me go back a little bit um you can see this is a, a bleed valve here of i, I believe of oxygen oh you're not seeing anything <laughs> uh bleed of oxygen that's where uh gaseous oxygen is, is pumped out and of course as it hits the cold vacuum of space it actually oftentimes freezes down and becomes a solid. So you'll see chunks of oxygen. So, um, yeah, that's I believe that's an oxygen bleed valve. And that's why it becomes chunks of oxygen. And it sits there on the manifold. Pretty crazy. I love that kind of stuff. It's nuts. All right, let me get this caught back up here on so we don't miss anything because we're getting close actually to, uh, to everything. Let me make sure we're in. All right, let's keep going here. Uh, yeah, that's sorry, Brian. Same question. Hopefully I just answered that. That's the best of what I know. Uh, thank you, Brian, for the, for the generous donation. Um, why call it an orbital insertion? It's not showing an orbital path on screen. Uh, Zach, it, it is showing an orbital path on screen. The thing you're seeing that what, that's weird though, it is an orbital path. What, what you're seeing is orbit. The, the difference is um, it's relative to it's, it's like fixed relative to earth because the earth is spinning the ground track. And the other difference is not just the ground track of the orbit, but they will be doing, um, another engine burn here soon. So that will actually change the orbit, change the inclination of the orbit. Um, and that will make it so that will be the new orbit. So you actually are seeing two paths and multiple paths. Um, it is a little confusing because sometimes I don't remember if it actually does follow if it's relative to earth or if it is stationary and the earth is is rotating underneath it and if those lines are the upcoming orbits which i think they are i think the blue line is like the upcoming orbit yeah it's not the the, the most easy thing to see but it is in orbit at this point ses2 uh or unless you're saying about the um yeah it is definitely an orbital insertion when you see when you see that guy uh yes i agree uh this was definitely one of the most epic uh, launches I've seen to, in a long time, in a very long time. That was beautiful. The other one I would, the other one that I thought was pretty good too, um, was uh, the the most recent transporter mission was also awesome. Man, this is funny. I'm playing it. Why is it not caught up yet? <laughs> I'm playing this at like 1.5, so I'm hearing it faster. But it's set as live. Look at this speed. Like, why isn't it? It says it's live. 
Come on, buddy. Let me just manually fast forward. Is that really true? Because if you do this, are we going into the future? That's so weird. Well, by my clock, we're 51 minutes in. So once this gets up to 51 minutes, hopefully it goes back down to normal speed. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. It'll be catching up. Anyway, that's my fun YouTube experiment for the day. Uh, let's see. This is David. Yes, that was the prettiest launch I've seen yet. The sun setting behind the booster as it landed on LZ1. Chef's kiss. Yeah, that was... That was awesome. If you saw that in, in person, David, I'm very jealous. That would have been one that I would have loved to see. Um, Keith, yes, also noticing the venting on the Merlin. Great, great observations here from everybody. Uh, Pedro Benson um, saw both stages, including the entry burn from Brooksville, Florida, which is 40 miles north of Tampa, so about 60 kilometers north of Tampa. Uh, we are parallel to Orlando on the West Coast. Wow, that's amazing. So, I've, yeah, but my parents got quite the show, too, because they're, again, on the – the Gulf Coast right now. So um, this is a good question here from Raz121. What effects, uh, what effect does Earth spin have on acceleration? So it, it's it exactly, it, it affects it at the speed of the Earth's rotation. The Earth spins at approximately right around 1600 kilometers an hour, a thousand miles an hour, roughly. And so if you're at the equator and you launch due east, you basically get a thousand, you know, or 1600 kilometer an hour boost just from the rotation of the Earth. And that's good because, again, you need to be going 28,000 kilometers an hour to get into orbit, right? So, so you know, everyone thinks about altitude of space. It's really, uh, you only have to go up on Earth to get out of the atmosphere. That's the only reason we have to go up. Otherwise, you could orbit, you know, if you had a straight line where there was no mountains or anything, or not a straight line, but a, a straight path on Earth with no mountains or no terrain, you could be orbiting just above the surface, but you'd have to be going, you know, 28,000 kilometers an hour. Uh, a little faster, actually, because the closer you are to the Earth, the, the faster your orbit has to be. So the only reason we really go up is to get out of the atmosphere because the atmosphere will slow you back down. So you get out of the atmosphere, you know, just as you imagine, you know, if you've ever driven up a mountain like in Colorado or anything, you know, the air gets thinner and thinner. And by like, you know, by if you're anywhere near like four or five thousand meters, you're you start getting out of breath. Right. You know, like 15,000 feet. Uh, is is quite high, you know, 14,000 foot mountain. I've, I've been up a couple 14,000 foot mountains and you definitely get pretty short of breath up there. And so, you know, you can just imagine the atmosphere doesn't just stop at like, you know, we, we delineate earth or, you know, space is a hundred kilometers in altitude, but it's not like at a hundred kilometers. That's where there was atmosphere below it and no atmosphere above it. It's just tapering. And by the time you, you know, by the time you're even at 10 kilometers, like where airplanes fly, the atmosphere is pretty darn thin. You're above like, most of the atmosphere, the vast majority of the atmosphere, you're above at 10 kilometers. So by 50 kilometers, you're, by all intents and purposes, you're pretty much in space at that point. You know, if you open the door, you're going to be experiencing, you know, 99.9% .9 vacuum or something. The amount of pressure up there is very little. So by 100 kilometers, you know, that's just kind of generally agreed upon. You can, you can orbit at 100 kilometers because there is so little um, air resistance there that you won't get slowed down by... Um, by the air so hey here we go that's right i had a video orbit versus suborbit you're right you can find that here on youtube <laughs> i forgot about that i need to do a better one on that a longer one those shorts i don't like shorts people complain about shorts i don't know shorts are weird uh cliff m thank you for the membership um Yes, they also did get this. You're right, Edward. I forgot about this. They did recently get a military contract to consider Starship for point to point cargo on Earth. So, yes, even the U.S. Air Force, I believe, is very interested in Starship point to point. So it's it's slightly beyond total pipe dream, um, and into the more the realm of like this it has some funding behind it. It actually might be a thing. Sounds like we're about to get back into this here for the second engine ignition. But yeah. It, you're right. Great call. Thank you so much for the reminder, uh, admin. I, I appreciate that. Space Boy, thank you for becoming a member. I really appreciate it. Um, oh, here we go. 
Welcome back to the webcast of the Falcon 9 mission carrying the Cosmos SkyMed satellite for our customer, Talus Alenia Space. We've had a nominal mission so far. Falcon 9 launched on time at 6.11 p.m. Eastern Time from Space Launch Complex 40. We successfully recovered the first stage back on land tonight, and that was the third land landing for this specific booster. While second stage completed its first burn, taking the Cosmos SkyMed satellite into an initial parking orbit. Now we're just a few seconds away from the second ignition of the MVAC engine carrying the second stage and Cosmos SkyMed into the orbit needed to deploy the satellite. MVAC startup. And shutdown. And there we got a quick view. Just waiting for confirmation of good orbit here. Nominal payload deploy orbit. And great news, we just had SES-2 and SECO-2. It was a quick three second burn. We also got confirmation of a good orbital insertion. The Cosmos SkyMed satellite is still attached to Falcon 9 second stage and payload deployment is planned to occur around two plus one hour. And as a reminder, the mission today is for our customer, Talus Alenia Space, and the constellation is owned by the Italian Space Agency and Ministry of Defense. To help us better understand the capabilities of the Cosmos SkyMed constellation, here's an explanation from the Italian Space Agency's president and head of programs directorate. The Cosmos SkyMed second generation right, is a again, <laughs> we always get like co uh, copyright strikes for these types of things. So we'll wait until we get the uh, until we get the deploy, then we'll bring them back up. But all right, let's answer. This is a good one here from uh, Chris Collis here. Uh, with some work, could it be possible for Super Heavy to get to Leo by itself if it didn't have Starship on top of it to either be a massive tanker and or allow for fast deep space missions. So any now we're getting, of course, into the <laughs> the infamous words, single stage to orbit. It's one stage getting to orbit. And there is absolutely zero way to make a single stage to orbit faster or uh, have any more payload to orbit than a multi-stage rocket. It's just physically impossible. I know people tend to think. So here's the thing. If you if you wanted to just use a super heavy booster, you could probably get something like, I think it's, we've done the calculations. It's something like 50 to 100 tons or something like that. Um, you can actually get it into orbit, but now you don't have any way of returning it. You have, you'll just be throwing away that booster. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's not going to get there any faster, like rapid speed. It's the same amount of orbital insertion. Um, I, I believe it's about that. I believe it is like 50 tons. It's, it's more than I thought for a single stage door because it is a huge, huge, huge vehicle. But um, by all accounts, uh, if they were to expend, because you did expend the booster there. Now, if you were to expend a booster and and just even do super heavy or just even do a Starship on top of it, Starship and recovering Starship, but expending the, the booster like we did for the single stage door. But I think you could get something more like uh, 250 or 300 tons. You can get three times more payload if you just expended the booster. Now, if you expended both Starship and Super Heavy, you could get something like five or six or 700 tons to orbit. Like it's absolutely no contest, um, you know, cause the main reason that they're getting that much uh, payload capacity out of an SSTO is just simply because they're expending it. So if expending is on the table, if you're okay throwing away a booster, you're a lot better putting Starship on top of it. Um, and even a reusable Starship, even reusing Starship and you'd get three times the payload mass. I'll, I'll run those numbers for an upcoming video. Joining us, we had an on-time launch at 6.11 p.m. Eastern Time, followed by successful ascent, stage separation, first stage landing, and two second stage engine burns. Now, the booster that supported today's Cosmos SkyMed mission successfully landed for the third time back on land at landing zone one. And we have just one more major milestone coming up, and of course, that is the deployment of the Cosmos SkyMed payload from Falcon 9's second stage. And we're coming up on that in a few seconds here, and we've got a great live view. Payload deploy confirmed. 
incredible view of the Cosmos SkyMed satellite drifting away from our Falcon 9 second stage. That is visual confirmation of payload deploy. And that will also bring our webcast to a close. All of us here at SpaceX want to give a big thank you to our customer, Talis Alenia Space, for entrusting us with today's mission for Italy's Space Agency and Ministry of Defense. We also want to give a shout out to the Range and Federal Aviation Administration for supporting today's mission. And of course, thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in. Have a great night and we'll see you again soon. Yes, because they have a lot more launches coming up here. They are going to be busy. So again, I think currently on the schedule, Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I, I'm pretty sure, you know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure they're still doing a Starlink launch tomorrow and then another launch on the West Coast on Wednesday. Uh, let's see. Mike in Discord is saying, Tim, the question was more about the option to use Starship as a tanker in orbit or maybe refuel it and have enormous enormous speeds. You could launch something uh, without uh, something could launch something without of orbit so the, the okay no like it's in no way is putting super heavy into space a better option for uh, a tanker or to be able to like launch from there right so um so you, you have to keep in mind okay so say you put a starship in orbit right and use that as as a tanker as a dedicated depot um at least there you now have vacuum optimized raptors you have a payload but you have all these other things that you could be doing um, Super Heavy is not designed to be, you know, used as an injection, as, as a, a vehicle to get you from uh, low Earth orbit to anywhere else in space. It has sea level engines, a lot of them. Uh, you can get substantially better performance by just uh, having vacuum optimized Raptors. Uh, you know, and think about how many it would take. If it takes, I think the current number they're saying to actually fill Starship, uh, I think it's, it's close to like seven because it's uh, about 1,200 pounds of fuel, 1,200 tons of fuel, sorry and about 150 pay tons of payload mass. So I don't know, what is that, seven-ish trips? How many would it take to fill up a super heavy? You know, you have 14 trips. Um, it's just really, it, it, anytime anytime someone talks about getting super heavy into orbit, it's just, the math never works out. It never works out to get a super heavy into orbit. You'd be a lot better if you want a depot, Get send up a dedicated depot. Send up just an empty tank on a, on a starship, you know, uh, or, uh, you know, if you need to have like a, a, a special variant, that, since it's only going to be a depot, don't put it in Starship, have it just be a dedicated upper stage. That's just a depot that has as few Raptor engines as possible. So it's not just dead mass up there uh, that has, you know, uh, no reentry system, no anything else, just a big giant dumb tank, basically with a couple engines to get it, you know, to kick itself into orbit. And yeah, maybe, maybe then it's better to, to go ahead and, you know, deorbit Use the you know use it as much of the the boosters you can and, and expend that booster. Get this huge depot up into space, but it just does not make you know much sense to use the super heavy as because it's not like the space shuttle uh, or you know the external fuel tank on the space shuttle basically got to orbit. There was talks of using the space shuttle uh, tank, you know the orange external fuel tank, to use that as a depot or use it as something like that. Uh, that was considered for a long time, but. Um, because it gets to like 97% the speed of orbit. So it's already almost in orbit. If you had a light enough payload, you could easily put, they could have easily put an orange external fuel tank into orbit and had it up there as a depot. And guess what? That literally is just a big, dumb fuel tank. There's nothing else, uh, you know, it doesn't have any extra dead weight of engines, nothing else. It's just an external fuel tank. So, you know, in that case, uh, that, I think people think of that. Or, you know, for the example, they used the third stage of the Saturn V uh, to become Skylab. They basically emptied out the third stage of a Saturn V and they turned it into Skylab. It's still one of the coolest things ever, in my opinion. Uh, that launched in, uh, let's see, that was like, uh, was it before or after Apollo Soyuz? I don't remember. Anyway. Um, yeah, Skylab was basically just an empty third stage. But don't forget that the third stage of the Saturn V could be launched into orbit by the first two stages of the Saturn V. So um, there's not going to be a rocket that makes sense to use the first stage to get it into orbit and have it be a single stage to orbit and ever have it make 
sense. Sorry. Uh, I will. I need to do an updated video on single stage orbit vehicles because I still get a lot of questions about it. Um, there's a new single stage orbit player coming onto market that's claiming to be a single stage orbit space plane. Super stoked for the idea. I will be happy to be proven wrong. But when you're talking about payload mass and literally dollar per payload and the operational cost of launching, I think SpaceX has it right. Um, and, I, and the math just always works out in favor of multi-stage rockets. If it didn't, everyone would be doing it the other way. So there's a reason. Um, thank you so much, Jonas, for the tip. I appreciate that. Um, go for launch 13. Um, hey, Tim, on a launch, what is the plan for uh, range clear for boats, planes, etc.? And what mechanics software does the Falcon 9 use? Also, a side question, how much is the Falcon 9? So these are all uh, pretty specific questions. Uh, the range clear of what's the plan for range clear for boats, planes? Well, they have, uh, you know, that's what the Coast Guard, a lot of the, you know, Coast Guard and all of the uh, the Air Force literally is out there tracking marine assets, tracking uh, you know, planes have trackers and all that stuff, you know, so they literally know where all of these assets are. Every person in the area, if you are out there and you're, uh, you know, a Marine, if you're out there and you, you go boating out there all the time, you have to be looking up the NOTAMs. They're considered notice to airmen, and they're literally just a statement that's put out uh, for upcoming activity that's that's not that you're not allowed to launch. so people on the East Coast should be very used to this. If you're in that area, you should be having to look at those NOTAMs and just uh, and just know. Uh, so that's one of it. Uh, what mechanics software does the, the like we said the mechanics and software? That's a lot. There's a lot to that question. There's a lot of stuff. Like we said with the flight software, we don't have a lot of specific information. Um, they do code in uh, what is it they actually code in? They code in a very common language. Um, I am not a computer programmer. I've never written a line of code in my life, so I can't tell you. But they do talk about that a decent amount in uh, a couple different books. Uh, someone remind me that was a big push for Elon is he wanted it to be a code that people actually wrote in instead of like C plus uh, plus what it's not Python. It's uh, I cannot remember. Uh, but yeah. And how much does the Falcon nine cost? It, it, I believe to, to launch on a Falcon nine, I think the lowest price we've seen so far is about 50 million. So it's safe to assume the vehicle is something like 25 to th 20 to $30 million to produce. SpaceX has never told us the number of how much it costs them to produce a single, um, oh, it is C++. They do code in C++ as opposed to, it was something else that they wanted to code in C++ as, op as opposed to some other just junk language. I don't remember. Thank you, chat, for reminding me. Um, yeah, they do code in C++, which was very unique. I think they're the first company to, to write rocket software and flight software in C++. The, the traditional aerospace industry used, uses something that I don't remember. <laughs> yes, thank you guys for the reminder. Uh, this is from um, Tamara MCN. Do we offer women's shirts? So our, so our shirts, we need to remind people they are uh, – they're very fitted. They're, they're quite fitted T-shirts. Uh, they, you know, I see women wear them, uh, a lot too. So, um, even though they aren't specifically cut for women, they are, uh, they are fitted shirts. So they do fit on women quite well. Uh, they might not get small enough. So we have, I know some women that will wear, uh, the, the tiny human sizes ones. So if you are small, uh, even if you're not a baby or a toddler, but, um, youth sizes, you know, uh, are options for smaller, more petite people. But yeah, our, I mean, these, these shirts are unisex. Um, we, we are, try, I am trying to figure out something that's um, a little bit more um, women friendly for, uh, we're working on a dress wear line that will be coming out pretty soon too, hopefully for, for their button up shirts. Uh, they are, those are straight off of a men's cut. Um, I would like to find some, something interesting for women because that will be a little bit more exclusive to a men's proportion. So um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Like I said, we do see a handful of women in these at all times. So, um, thank you so much to Patrick, uh, Guidera. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Um, keep trying to get through some of these here. We still have quite a few. Uh, thank you very much for the membership. I really appreciate that. Um, this is from Adam Lee. Given all the development in space tourism, how long do you think it'll be until they start taste, taste testing space station prototypes for tourism? Now. Like, we're literally in that process right now. Axiom is working on space station modules uh, 
that will be attaching to the International Space Station that will at first be kind of piggybacking off of the infrastructure of the ISS, but with the goal of free flying and becoming its own commercial space station. So that's already in the works. There's And then there's there is recently the commercial uh, space station contracts or whatever it is, proposals, and a bunch of companies won. I need to catch up on that. That's It's been a while since I have even... I didn't dive into that one too much, but yeah, that's, that's very much on the horizon. I would expect to see some kind of uh, commercial space station or at least for sure more commercial. Cause even like um, there's the beam module on the ISS. That was a, a, a private uh, that was from Bigelow. They unfortunately went out of business uh, and they now gave over that portion of this, their, their module to the space station. But that was a commercial venture hoping to be able to make commercial space stations. So it hasn't worked out so far. But, uh, yeah, um, hopefully this is uh, with, the, with the new future, with, with as many commercial flights and orbital commercial flights as we're seeing lately, uh, I think there will actually be desire and need and demand for a commercial space station, which is very, very exciting. Finally, um, <laughs> Alexander, you owe me something. I don't know what. Coffee, something. Cause I saw it. I saw it and I put it up on the screen. Uh, Michael, when will KSP2 arrive? When it's done. <laughs> you guys know that saying for me. When it's done, my friends. You know, it looks like they're making some really good progress. Uh, people always, you know, with stuff like this, and when I was working on, like, the Russian rocket engine video, people were like, well, why don't you just release it now? It's like, because it's not done. <laughs> like, I'm not going we – got, we've got to this weird – and we need to stop doing this. I think that pressure that we put on people to get stuff done – leads to terrible releases of projects. There have been some horrendously launched video games that have come out that people pay money for and you're completely in beta. And and they just release it because they're like, they have a lot of pressure to get it done. And even though it's not done, they know there's tons of problems with it. They just release it and it's horrible. We should stop doing that. And, and this is someone that owns Tesla's full self-driving package, which is very much in beta. And I'm been I paid for beta three and a half years ago. You know, like this is, uh, it's not a great practice. I don't like that. I don't want people to rush and get something incomplete out. I'm a fan of, of quality. I want things to be done right the first time. Um, I, you guys know me. I really care a lot about the quality of my videos. I care a lot about the quality of the things that I um, give out to the world. I want them to be high quality. And, I, and it comes at a cost of yeah, sometimes you got to wait a little longer. And I think we've lost patience as a society because we're instant gratification for everything. So, K sorry, this is not meaning anything about you, Michael. Uh, just for any, any of those wondering about KSP2, I know they've been putting a ton of work in and they have a pretty small team. Uh, and I know they want to do it right. You know, the game just unfortunately probably is not ready, but I cannot wait for Kerbal Space Program 2. For those of you that don't know what KSP2 is, Kerbal Space Program 2. It should be awesome. But that's my answer. I think they align with that somewhat because they've uh, they definitely are, are it's not like they're sitting on their hands hoping that it gets done. I know they're working hard to get it done. Um, let's see this. Yeah, Doug, like I said, this that is who I'd reach out to if we had uh, needed to do a fundamentals of control systems. It would 100 um, uh, percent uh, going to be something that we do with with Joe Bernard. So I've done actually I've done collabs with Joe Bernard. He was on my – so back in the day, I did a Facebook watch show. So Facebook had their own original program. They were trying to compete with, like, you know, Netflix and all these other companies, you know, HBO and everyone that has their own original programming. F Facebook was paying to do productions, like a legit production. I had a team of, you know, 10 people on set, and we made a very cheesy, like, Discovery Channel type show, you know, very out there, like way too, way too much. That, that character buildup is what pushed me into just being myself. Because I was definitely trying to be a character. And then we were pushing, you know, it's very, like, ridiculous. And uh, these days I'm like, no, nah, I just would rather be myself. So that's why I don't wear a spacesuit anymore. And that's why my demeanor is just me instead of uh, always being like, that's why, you know, like, <laughs> that's just so annoying. So anyway, yeah, he was in that. He was in the Facebook Watch show. And uh, we have collaborated. We're good friends. We, we, we catch up often. Uh, anytime we're anywhere in the same vicinity as each other, we hang out. So we can absolutely, he would be who I would go to for fundamentals of controls. So, uh, space boy, thank you so much for the tip. I appreciate that. Um, uh, God's God's eye says catching a booster is pretty cool, but I'm definitely going to miss the booster landing by itself. I mean, just look at how cool Falcon nine looks landing by it. I have to disagree. Thank you for your tip, but I have to say uh, you're going to get all of the action and excitement watching a booster fall out of the sky. 
and you're going to be getting the plume interacting with the ground. All of the exciting things that you love about a Falcon 9, only now we have a literal rocket, uh, a robot going to be trying to basically catch this thing uh, before it touches the ground. Don't think of it as catching a rocket because it's really not catching. It's like it's not going to be like actively really. I think it's a lot more static. It's basically it's becoming the landing gear. Instead of having land, just think of it that way. It's it's a giant set of landing gear, right? And all it's doing is helping to arrest a little bit and shock absorb a little bit of that velocity. So it's not really even going to be tracking it. I, I think it'll be stationary when the booster lands on it. And then just by default, there will be some slack in it. You know, have some give and it will, you know, kind of take out a little bit of the, the just like when the Falcon 9 lands, it's kind of got a little bit of a some shock from the from the landing legs. It's basically removing all those systems because even think about the landing legs. You know, when you land, you're putting torque into the tank wall. You're putting forces into that tank wall and all four of them are now trying to crush those those walls. So that, you know, that part has to be all reinforced. There's a lot of extra weight besides just the actual legs, you know, besides just the little bits of hardware that, are, that you see here, you know, the, the telescopes and the this, all of that stuff is weight, but all of the structure that is added to support those legs also weighs a lot. On a, on a vehicle that weighs 150 tons dry, uh, you're talking about having to add another 20 or 30 tons or something like that to make it have landing legs. So the best part is no part, as Elon would say. And why not just put something that can absorb the shock of, of landing, absorb the landing impact, uh, and just have that all be on the ground side. Just like you don't want to put, you know, you, you want as much stuff on the ground, like to, to spin up the engines and do all those things as possible. Uh, you might as well have as much weight, dead mass, be on the ground as possible too. So I think that's what they're going for. Yeah. Um... So, uh, but we'll see. I think it's going to be exciting. I think once you see one get caught, the video of it getting caught, I think you're going to think watching a Falcon 9 land looks, although it is really cool. You're right. A Falcon 9 landing is really, really cool. But I think it's going to be ex unbelievably exciting to watch uh, a rocket be caught by a tower. That's my opinion. Uh, Space Boy. Uh, how do you think SpaceX would refuel Starship? Uh, this is a great question. So in orbit, um, Starship, there's been a, a few different things. Uh, for a little while. So originally they were going to dock kind of side by side, you know, two of them dock side by side and have some kind of docking port mechanism. Then they had a really good idea. And I really miss this idea. Um, there was plans to have uh, fuel refueling uh, little ports basically that attach so that when the, when the booster was getting filled up, uh, the upper stage on top of it would actually have fueling ports on the inside here. So you'd actually have little fueling ports that fuel from the booster up to the second stage. Are you with me? So, so you don't actually have to have umbilicals up here while it's being fueled. You fuel the upper stage through the first stage, and that fuel just goes up, and they keep filling it until the upper stage is full. But what's crazy about that um, is what was really cool is then you could do butt-to-butt -butt docking and actually have two starships connect via those same ports. I always thought that was the coolest thing ever. Um, I don't think that's the plan anymore, if I recall. And that's how – so now I'm, I'm not sure what it's going to be. It might be through a nose or something, but there'll be some way to dock. And then once the two are docked, you just have to accelerate towards the one that you want to uh, accelerate towards the one you want to drain. And all of the propellant will, will eventually just move over. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry that I'm teasing you with the model. I can't help it. If I'm such a, if I have a visual reference of something, it's just perfect. Uh, yeah. So there you go. That's, uh, that's, that's the way they plan to do it. Most recently it was butt to butt, but I don't think we've seen a good update on the on the current plans. But we will see. That should be coming up here in the next year or two. Hopefully we see some refueling attempts on orbit. It's never been cryogenic propulsion uh, propellants have never been transferred. I don't I don't think in orbit. Um, kind of, I mean if you think about it in a way though, not in orbit but in space. You know the uh, the space shuttle had to continually transfer propellant from the external fuel tank into the vehicle. So I mean it's not really the same. And it's always under acceleration when it did that. It never, uh, you never had like a stopping moment, transfer propellant into the tank and then, you know, anything like that. But it, I mean, yeah, we will, we, this will be all new. So, um, let's see, uh, Ron Smith. Hey Tim, any insights into the source selection document for the CLD award? Surprised to see relativity on it. Uh, the, the commercial launch, uh, directive is that the D is I forget. Um, I don't have any in sources on, uh, honestly, I've been so tuned in right now to trying to get these new videos online. And then some of the stuff we're doing out at Starbase that I haven't been diving into it, but I think, 
Uh, who I would listen to on that would be Anthony Colangelo from Miko, the podcast Miko. If you guys don't subscribe and listen to Miko, uh, definitely do. Uh, Anthony definitely is on top of like any contracts and governmental stuff like that. He's so good at that. He just pays more attention to that stuff uh, and breaks it down really, really, really well and has a lot more insight, uh, a lot more thoughtful <laughs> insights than, than I would. So, um, yeah. Uh, but, you know, Relativity is, you know, they're, they're coming along. They are hoping to be launching here really soon. Fully 3D printed rocket crazy. And uh, it sounds like, you know, it, from what it sounds like, it sounds like they're the first rockets we're going to see are basically just, you know, prototypes to be able to prove out that they know how to launch, blah, blah, blah. And that they should be scaling up to the Terran R pretty quickly, uh, which would be really cool. Because that's the cool thing about 3D printing. It's not like you have all these sunk costs into tooling and all of these things. You literally just start printing it different, which is kind of their whole plan is like just iterate quickly. So once they have a successful launch, there's not much to keep them from just building larger and building larger and, and bigger, building better and blah, blah, blah. So... Um, man, if this is Tom Parks, this is the Tom Parks. Tom, you don't have to tip me. This is this is my best friend since second grade. Tom Parks, ladies and gentlemen. Everyone, say hello, Tom. And to the rest of the Parks family. Wow, what a treat to know that Tom Parks is watching. Taking a break from saving kids' lives as being in the public school system. <laughs> I have to say, sorry, I don't mean saving lives, but dude, Tom does incredible work in one of the most wild environments in Minneapolis. Um, yeah. So hi, Tom. Hello, Parks. Thank you for watching. Man, all my friends are hanging out here today. We got Tom. We got Caitlin down at the Cape. Crazy. This is this is fun. Um, it's funny because most of my friends and family, uh, my family will watch. My parents will watch. Like most of my friends don't really pay attention to what I do. Like my day-to-day -day life, uh, at least here in, in Iowa, is nothing to do with rockets. You know, people don't ask me too much. I mean, like my friend Neil Price will ask about rockets sometimes and watch a little bit. Maybe I'll get a question or two here or there, but like it's not anything really about what I what I do for a job. It's almost like very different worlds. So I'm always very surprised when someone locally or one of my friends or family is actually asking me about space flight stuff. I'm like, oh, well, let me tell you, you know, it's like, yeah, it's funny. Um, okay. Skylab launched before Apollo Soyuz. Okay. I forgot. Thank you so much for letting me know. That is exactly what I needed. Uh, from NH Gaming, what's my opinion on the Gateway Foundation? The Gateway Foundation, um, if I recall, is the mega space station concept. Um, uh, let me see. Let me, uh, space, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the spaceport it's, I mean, all these things are great ideas. I, I think we absolutely should be having giant cruise ships around earth. And I love that gateway, uh, the gateway foundation has been around for a long time trying to make, you know, giant, you know, stuff like this. But of course this stuff costs money. You know, there so far, I haven't seen any real current oh look at that they've got like a, a starship looking thing now that does look like a starship render multiple starships that's cool i mean this is this to me this is an eventuality you know this is like this should be happening at some point in the future i don't see why we won't have this in the future um so yeah so i think this is uh you know a group of i, I don't know much about the the them to be honest um Wow, that is cool. I mean, I've seen these renders before, but I just, I don't quite know. Uh, so let me read. The Gateway Spaceport was formed uh, to build the first spaceport. Our plan includes developing a robust space construction industry, the first artificial gravity space station, and finally the Gateway. These are important first steps to colonizing space and other worlds. The Gateway Spaceport will connect people from all over the world so we can make the first step together. Um yeah, I mean, of course, space cruise ships, get them, get them up into space and out of the <laughs> exclusion zones of rocket launches. I'm all for that for sure. And like I said, in my opinion, this is kind of an eventuality. Like, I, I expect this kind of thing. And if they are working, you know, I, I think a, a thing like this will become vastly obvious once we have, you know, if this the price of spaceflight becomes uh, 10 times cheaper or 100 times cheaper than it is today, this is just an absolute inevitability. And that's really exciting. So I think they're, you know, they're kind of waiting for the technology to catch up to their vision because the vision is very grand and very exciting, but it would require some cheap rides to space, in my opinion. 
Um, otherwise, there's just not an economy for it. Uh, let's see. Ben Roberts. Hey, Tim, will the first orbital Starship test be just the booster or will it be Starship configuration? Sorry if this has already been asked. No, Ben, you're, you're, uh, that's a good question. Uh, the, the current plans would be to do a full stack test because the biggest, one of the biggest things they're trying to test isn't necessarily the super heavy booster. Like, yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's kind of just a booster though. SpaceX knows how to make a booster. Uh, yes, it has a lot more engines. Yes. It's, uh, you know, using a totally different system for some things, but in general, they, they kind of know how to do that. So that's not the big crazy part. The big crazy part, something they haven't really done on anyone's done at this scale, uh, besides the space shuttle would be trying to re-enter uh, and reuse an orbital spaceship. So the re-entry portion is what they're really hoping to test out of the first super heavy test. They're hoping to to bring in that starship at crazy high velocities and uh, and really start putting, you know, putting the heat shield to the test uh, and just seeing how that type of thing will survive. And that will give them a good amount of data to know if they're good to continue proceeding, you know? So, yeah. Well, guys, I think that's going to do it for me. I've been online for way too long. It is dinner time. So uh, again, if you want to support what I do uh, and help us continue to make awesome videos, I cannot wait for you to see our updated uh, video about uh, rocket engine cycle types. As you know, one of our, one of my favorite videos to date still is way back in the day, the, the Raptor engine video, which has that Raptor, Raptor schematics that you probably see on such a saw on screen uh, and we'll see on screen again here in a second. This, you know, this schematic that you're maybe familiar with at this point, we're updating that making it a lot cleaner, easier to look at. Also, uh, get, but still getting into more detail. We're gonna start showing pressures, showing the pressure gradient, the temperature gradients throughout engines. We're getting really deep into the rocket engine cycles. A lot of animations. Casper and Andrew have been doing animations now for the past couple of weeks. So we're quite a ways into this video already. Uh, and that's only possible because of the support of everyone here. If you're watching, if you're uh, super chats, uh, that all comes into play. Also, if you you know want to help support, uh, one of the most fun ways is probably by going to the store, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Don't forget, you can get 15% off if you use coupon code launch day uh, on either one of these RD-171 shirts um, in homage to the, uh, the recent Soviet video that we put out. Um, yep. So again, everydayastronaut.com slash shop, click on, uh, use coupon code launch day, all one word, all lowercase for 15% off. And also another fun way of course is hello discord and all of our lovely discordians. Uh, and those of you guys that are, uh, supporters on Patreon and, or YouTube members, again, that helps massively. So if you do want to support what we do, patreon.com slash everyday astronaut is probably the easiest way that way you can gain access to our awesome discord channel. And they are awesome for exactly that reason. Uh, looks like there's one more here from uh, from God's eye. My parents told me about the time when Skylab crashed. People were so afraid that it was going to crash on land. They thought it was the last day on Earth, but it ended up crashing in the ocean. Yeah, that was a big deal. Kind of, I mean, we recently had a scare like that too with, uh, you know, the Long March 5B uh, that uh, launched uh, the space station, the Tiangong 1 space station or whichever one it exactly is. Uh, because the it does not have a deorbit capability, so it just uh, it decayed and eventually this giant I mean, that was bigger than Skylab even the core stage came crashing down and that's not good. So yes, um, that was a thing. That was absolutely a thing, and hopefully we stop seeing that kind of thing in the future. So, all right, everybody, that is going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Thank you so much for hanging out with me and congratulations SpaceX on finally getting that bird off the ground. Beautiful launch. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right. Bye everybody.